Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for being here. Today I'm joined by Peter Walk from Efficiency Vermont to talk about the Button Up Vermont campaign. But first, I want to start with an update on Hurricane Helene, which has devastated areas across the southeast part of our country. The photos and stories we're hearing shows the impact of intense rain, the flooding, loss of homes, businesses, and complete communities. Roads and bridges swept away, and the tragic loss of life is breathtaking. Many are living without basic needs like water, sewer, electricity, and cell service. And we've experienced some of what they're going through right here in Vermont over the last decade. And our thoughts go out to those impacted. The last year, and again this year, when we saw floodwaters rising and asked other states to come to Vermont and help out, many did so without hesitation. So when the call came in to send an urban search and rescue team to help Florida during the storm, and then to North Carolina to help with recovery efforts, we didn't hesitate. And I want to thank the USAR team who have been away from their families and working in very difficult conditions over the last couple of weeks. And unfortunately, their work is far from over. Mr. Morrison will go into more detail in a minute, and we'll continue to stay in touch with all states impacted and help out wherever we can. Efficiency Vermont launched their annual button up campaign yesterday, which helps Vermonters weatherize their homes and prepare for winter. Now, I know these days many Vermonters are struggling just to make ends meet say nothing about where the extra money would come from for home repairs. But here's some good news. Efficiency Vermont is launching a new home repair program, which Peter will talk about in a minute, helping eligible homeowners receive up to $15,000 for weatherization-related home projects, like insulation, roof repairs, heat pumps, plumbing, and more. At a time when Vermonters are keeping less of what they earn, with historic property tax increases, higher DMV fees, a payroll tax, and uh, high inflation, we need to do everything we can to make Vermont more affordable. Buttoning up a home helps homeowners save more money, use less energy, stay warm this winter, and lower heating costs, which is a win-win for everyone. I'll now turn it over to Peter. Uh, thank you, Governor. Uh, as you mentioned, my name is Peter Walk. I'm the Managing Director of Efficiency Vermont. Happy to be here today to announce one of the most important and uh, good news stories of the year, which is the launch of the Button Up campaign. We are here to talk about the benefits of weatherization, the opportunities to uh, address uh, leaky homes, where you might have uh, lack of comfort, other areas to help folks feel uh, more comfortable in the winters. Because as we woke up this morning to it's definitely a crisp in the air, and as we know, winter is coming. Um, as, as we look at and do analysis across the board, our annual energy burden report has uh, looked at household energy burden across the state, and home heating accounts for roughly a third of all household energy costs. So it's an important driver for the affordability issues that the governor just mentioned. Uh, the rising costs of staying warm uh, continues to add to that burden. We need to work to address those costs and to lower those costs for Vermonters across the board. That's why buttoning up is so important. Anything we can do to make homes warmer, use less energy, helps keep residents customer all year, and keep their costs down, help them save money over the long run. Button Up has some great partners and offers. No matter your goals or home needs, this is not just an efficiency Vermont effort. We work with partners across the state uh, to help folks make the changes that are right for them in their homes. As the governor mentioned, we're very excited. Uh, based on partnerships with the state using uh, some ARPA dollars, we're able to offer uh, this year a new uh, program to help Vermonters make the necessary repairs uh, that are often required to get to a weatherization project. So up to $15,000 for income qualified Vermonters uh, to be able to address these major issues, whether that be uh, repairs to roofs, windows, foundations, ventilation and ductwork issues, 
Uh, remediation for asbestos, vermiculite, and mold, which are huge barriers, especially uh, in our uh, old home stock. And issues around plumbing, uh, siding, and other things. Um, uh, any contractor can use this rebate to complete home repair measures as long as the repair are deemed necessary as part of an overall weatherization project. Uh, this offer is available uh, statewide. It is, uh, if you are a VGS customer or a BD customer, we recommend contacting them as this program, uh, the, this specific program does not, uh, is not eligible for those customers. After repairs are made, the next step is to button up. Taking steps to insulate and air seal can increase comfort ahead of winter. Completing a weatherization project can also reduce energy bills in the long run. It also boosts the resilience of your home, making it more durable to extreme weather and during power, power outages. Uh, I'd be remiss in, in, in calling out the great folks at the Department of Children and Families Office of Economic Opportunity run the State Weatherization Assistance Program. Uh, Low-income Vermonters can access free weatherization services through them and their community action agency and other partners. Overall, uh, if you come through Efficiency Vermont, comprehensive air sealing and insulation are available uh, through our home performance offer. Income eligible homes can get up to 75% off a weatherization project, up to $9,500. Households with slightly higher incomes can get 75% back up to 4,000. This rebate makes buttoning up your home more accessible and more affordable. And you'll enjoy that comfort year round, plus lower energy builds for a more efficient home. We also have great partners uh, to help make the financing of these projects more, more affordable. So a combination of incentives and financing can bring the average weatherization project down to uh, around $40 a month uh, based on a project size of about $12,000. We have great partners uh, in lending institutions around the state uh, who have worked with us on the Home Energy Loan Program, as well as the work in partnership with the Vermont Housing Finance Agency and the Vermont, and Vermont Gas Systems around the Weatherization Repayment Assistance Program, which allows you to pay back uh, the cost of weatherization project on your uh, utility bill. If you want to get your home truly weatherized, please contact us at Efficiency Vermont. We'll help you with a virtual, a free virtual home energy visit, which uh, you set up a time, get out your smartphone, we'll walk through your house with you as you show us around and help identify those opportunities that uh, need, additional, need additional research and understanding of where we're gonna be able to help you save the most energy. So please reach out and get started today. Thank you to Governor Scott for being with us every step of the way and launching this campaign. It's very important uh, that Vermonters know what resources are available to them. So as it gets colder, uh, please remember, button up. Thank you, Peter. Good afternoon. Uh, I'll be providing an update on Vermont's response to Hurricane Helene that impacted the Southeast United States. On Tuesday, September 24th, Vermont deployed a Type 2 swift water team consisting of 14 personnel, four boats, and five support vehicles to Florida to assist with the response to Hurricane Helene. The team arrived late Wednesday and was staged in the Pensacola area. On Thursday, the team traveled to the Tampa area to prepare for the storm's arrival. Helene made landfall late Thursday night, and our team began 911 responses early Friday morning. They made several rescues and continued working through the day into early Saturday morning. The team searched approximately 300 residences, discovered two structure fires, and evacuated approximately 20 persons and dozens of animals. Their work continued Saturday with searches for missing persons. They searched nearly 1,500 structures through the day and late into the night. On Sunday, the 29th, the team searched a 26-mile area along the inside of a barrier island area, specifically near Treasure Island. By Sunday afternoon, they were released by the state of Florida and reassigned to North Carolina to assist with flood response efforts there. An additional team of six personnel and associated support vehicles were deployed from Vermont to Buncombe County, North Carolina on Sunday evening to augment the team coming from Florida. They're, they're all together now working in the greater Asheville, North Carolina area. 
The team's initial work in North Carolina was focused in the Broad River area, a rural area about 20 miles east of Asheville. While some areas have been accessible by four-wheel drive vehicles, the team's operations have mostly occurred by insertion from helicopters. The search area is very mountainous with elevations very common of three to 5,000 feet. The team expects to finish this area tomorrow and then they will be repositioned in another area. Tentatively, they are scheduled to move to the Black Mountain area, which is a little north of their current location. The conditions our team have encountered have been catastrophic. The team leader, Mike Cannon, reported that the situation was hundreds of times worse than he had ever seen, and he's seen a lot. There has been extensive flooding and landslide activity in areas that are rugged on a blue sky day. As the governor mentioned, roads are mostly wiped out and countless homes destroyed. There is no water or sewer, no gasoline, no landline or cell coverage, no internet, and roads are barely passable with four-wheel drive vehicles. While these efforts are extremely difficult, the Vermont team is proud to join the combined response and complete this very important work. We've received daily briefings and we note that our USAR team is in good spirits and highly motivated to help make this terrible situation better by their contributions. It is not lost on us that the area our team is working is the home to one of the North Carolina Swiftwater teams that responded to Vermont in 2023 and made many rescues in the Lamoille County area. It was a team from Buncombe County that was stationed at the Cambridge Fire Department. Uh, so we'll have more to come as things unfold. We expect our team to be deployed for another week um, and we will update you as we're able to. And with that, I'll turn it back to the governor for Q&A. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, open up to questions. Governor, North Carolina and Vermont um, in recent years have both been kind of compared or said like we are positioned to both withstand climate change and severe weather um, better maybe, I think I'll say then, than some of the coastal states. I mean, at, how have you been thinking about, you know, in terms of the bigger question about climate change, where we put resources, you know, you've seen the, the devastation <clears throat> in South Carolina. How has that been weighing on you of where, where we put re state resources here in Vermont? Yeah, you know, it's, um, it's been eye-opening uh, for all of us. I think it started with Irene back about 12 years ago. We saw the highly intensive storms uh, that came to Vermont, and they hit our higher terrain. We think about floodwaters sometimes, and we think it have to be in the lowlands, um, but but it's just as devastating when when they're so intense, when there's such a volume of water, and it comes down in a short period of time, as we just experienced uh, in Lindenville, and uh, and so it's the same type of thing. It can it can hit us anywhere, any time. Um, and be just as devastating in the higher terrain as it is in the lower terrain. So this means that we have to mitigate in any way we can, better protect ourselves, upscale uh, culverts, uh, reinforce uh, riprap, roads and, and debris removal is important um, to get uh, ready for the next one. And, and again, you never know where that's going to be. Uh, I'll use, uh, I'll use uh, um, Village Road, uh, Red Village Road in, uh, in Linden, as an example, again. Um, that area was hit uh, very hard, um, but moving maybe four miles uh, to, the, to the north and hardly any damage at all. So it's very localized. And so, again, we just need to better prepare ourselves to mitigate against them uh, and, and make sure that we're uh, hardening uh, some of the uh, the areas that we thought were safe. FEMA, I mean, Congress isn't in right now. I believe it's the Disaster Aid Fund or one of them that gives money to municipalities or reimburses or reimburses them. Uh, that fund is at least as of right now run dry. What what is the latest from your understanding of um, towns and cities being able to be reimbursed for, for FEMA? Yeah, well, again, um, they had a continuing uh, resolution, I think, that, uh, that is going to take effect uh, that will help us get through this, uh, at least for those that uh, were, were promised money in the past. So I think this does open up uh, more money for Vermont, which is important. Uh, but I think, 
uh, again, uh, Congress understands uh, this doesn't hit, uh, this isn't political, this doesn't hit red states or, or blue states any differently. Uh, we've all, we've had devastation in almost every state uh, to some degree. So I think Congress will come together and uh, properly fund FEMA. I know Senator Welch is working on opportunities to, to make um, FEMA maybe use more user friendly. And, uh, and I think that there's, there's room for that. But at the same time, uh, they've, um, they've treated us well and uh, we've relied on them heavily uh, over the last two storms and certainly during Irene as well. Question for about the weatherization. Is, is it button up or, oh, it's button up, not buttoning up, okay. Uh, I could have answered that. Oh, okay. yeah. Do you have, um, do you have enough installers? Uh, I've heard that there's a real problem with just getting the work to, to do all this stuff. Sure. I mean, we, I think that you probably heard the governor talk multiple times from this podium about the challenge of workforce issues in the state of Vermont. Uh, weatherization is no different. Uh, on all of our uh, HVAC and other crews, we need more people in Vermont doing the great work so that we can help people save money and access the programs that are available to them. So do you have enough? Uh, at not at present, we are working. Uh, we have invested actually in Efficiency Vermont in the first time in our own uh, workforce development coordinator to help coordinate some of those efforts, but uh, there are, is significant work to be done to add the capacity needed to address the state's climate and energy goals. Uh, is this also for renters, uh, homeowners and renters, or just homeowners? Uh, I can follow up with you after. Okay. Um, and my last question is, I have heard that Efficiency Vermont ins uh, installations are significantly more expensive than just sort of a private weatherization. Uh, is that true? And uh, if so, why is that? And yeah. So we uh, make sure that the, the customer is protected as much as possible from uh, uh, jobs that don't meet the specifications it requires, that there aren't issues down the road. Um, it is important that those jobs get done well, and so there is a cost to that, but it's important for Vermonters' peace of mind to be able to make sure that their projects are done well. Uh, and uh, we are, are, have great partnerships through the Efficiency Excellence Network uh, to help get those projects done around the state. What, what is the total is it like pot of, of cash that this is coming from, like these rebates? The, the expansion of this new program, I guess, like what's the sure. total dollar figure? Sure, uh, we have been, you know, we have our standard weatherization funding that comes through our appointment through the PUC. This is specifically through $25 million in ARPA weatherization funding uh, that we are working on uh, with Commissioner Tierney at the Public Service Department. And also, do we know, kind of keeping it on flooding for a second, there was a big expansion last year of Know, helping people sure. upgrade home heating and whatnot. How, how did that money, how did that go? How much sure. was spent? Uh, so we're you know still working through that. As you can imagine, there are still customers that need that support to this day from the 2023 flooding. So we're still experiencing that. Uh, thanks to the good work of the emergency board, thanks to the governor and the legislature, uh, we have been able to expand at, at the availability of those uh, funds to 2024 flooding victims. We're working with the uh, Department of Public Service now to get that money rolled out as quickly as possible. Do we know how many people, either from last year or maybe this year too, don't have heat? I know that was a big issue last year, boilers getting flooded. Do we have a sense of how many people are going into the winter without a boiler? Um, I'm gonna let somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe, I believe it's around 54 uh, is the number that we're working on. Yes, that's the number I have. Okay. Doug, yeah, Doug do you want to add anything to that, Doug? I would say, Governor, that yes, that is the number that was recently provided. Um, our disaster case managers are actively working. I got notification of another, like, two cases that were closed uh, just this week. So we are actively working on that, and I'd like to thank Efficiency Vermont. Uh, we are drawing connections with them and the other utilities so that we can align our resources and, and get cases uh, closed more quickly. So they've been extremely helpful in that area. Also, speaking of heat, housing, 
there's a letter. I think you've probably seen it. Uh, 91 lawmakers, I believe, sent it to you um, for asking for a state of emergency, <coughs> asking for state-run non-congregate shelters. Have you seen the letter? What, what do you think of it? Uh, I have seen the letter. It's somewhat unusual for the legislature to want to give me more power when they've been trying to take power away from me uh, for these number of years. Um, we, um, many of those, uh, the 91 who signed it, I was surprised to read um, some who did sign on to it um, that were very involved in the budget and like four or five months ago uh, where all of this took place. Uh, I think one was the chair of the Appropriations Committee in the House. And uh, this all came from the legislature. We, at the uh, end of the legislative session, the chair of the House uh, Appropriations Committee and the Senate Appropriations Committee asked to meet with me to see if his uh, an approach where we could get this wrapped up. They wanted to make sure that we were unwinding the hotel motel program. Uh, and they put this proposal together and came to us and, and we agreed and, and uh, moved on. So most of the people, I believe, and the 91 legislators voted for that budget proposal. So I'm, uh, there's a bit of a disconnect, I think, at this point four months after it took effect, or even three months after, after July 1, this took effect. So we're, um, we're obviously, I want to focus on the areas where we agree. Um, we think that emergency shelters are needed. We've been asking for help in that respect. Um, they did come forth with $10 million. There's also money um, in with VHCB to do the same. Uh, we don't think it's enough, but it's a, it's a starting point. And uh, I think it's important for us to understand level set and see where we're at. And uh, I might ask uh, Secretary Samuelson if she could weigh in here and tell you a little bit about where we are with the emergency shelter program. Yeah, thank you, Governor. Um, I think you're exactly right. Um, as we begin to scale the program down, it's really important for us. What we've learned over the last few tra uh, transitions is really to level is really to level set where we're at. What we know is that at the starting place is that uh, what we're seeing is a much smaller number of people who were in need compared to the total GA exit. Um, and it, that's really important for us to keep at the forefront and in, in mind. Um, we've been working consistently since the legislation passed to work with communities and providers across the state to prepare and set up shelters, particularly focused um, on the winter months this winter. For that $10 million, um, and uh, Commissioner Winters and Deputy Commissioner um, Greg can go into it in more detail, we've worked with communities across the state to identify locations where shelters would be appropriate, where we had the staffing in communities. Um, and, and communities have come forward um, in you know, Burlington, in Rutland, and other locations across the state. As we make the transitions coming out of September um, and into October, um, we are working hard to identify areas and gaps on the ground. And we, we were planning ahead and anticipated that. So we know as we look at the, sh the um, spaces and places on the ground, um, we've had a triage team working with um, the Department for Children and Families and providers on the ground. Um, they've been communicating up front a long time for over the last two months with participants that this, the transitions were coming um, and really working to get to assist people in finding, um, in, in finding the services and the resources that they need. That triage team now um, has been working with local providers and <clears throat> identifying individuals with real, and families with complex needs and working to get them into locations. Many of them have only been willing to engage now as they're uh, within days uh, of their hotel room um, not being available to them. And we've been able to find um, uh, placements and skilled nursing facilities and others based on what their needs are. 
with the additional gaps across the state, um, we you know we know that large congregate shelters that are just based on the number of exits haven't worked in the past. But we are um, have identified and looking at the gaps that we might see in family shelters, um, and really are looking at what that might um, what that might look like going forward. But we would need the partnerships of the local municipalities and the local providers on the ground to make that work. And have been in conversations with communities based on the actual and specific needs that we're seeing on, on the ground now. I want to see if um, Commissioner uh, Winters has uh, other specific details um, to add, particularly around the allocation of that $10 million. And again, resources are constrained. Um, we have $10 million. Um, and, and that really has already been allocated um, for winter shelters this winter. So as we look at any additional shelters coming online, um, resources are, are really a, a core part of, of that discussion. Well, so Commissioner Winters. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Secretary. <clears throat> I'll say that the, um, the budget was signed into law on May 23rd. And by May 31st, we had a notice of funding out to uh, all providers and all communities uh, trying to gauge some interest in using that funding to stand up winter shelter. Uh, the legislature did put that $10 million into the, into the budget, uh, specifically targeted at standing up some winter shelter by December 31st. Uh, we had that notice out there uh, by May 31st with a deadline of July 10th for proposals. Um, we received uh, proposals totaling over $30 million uh, and, and multiple applications for that 10 million. We were able to narrow that to six projects that we thought were most viable. Um, and those total about $11 million. So we've been working hard over the last couple of months to try to make those come to fruition. Uh, there's a proposal in Burlington, there's a proposal in Rutland, a couple in Franklin County, uh, one in Montpelier, uh, and one in the Upper Valley, all expanding the number of shelter beds. I'll note that right now we're at about 535 uh, shelter beds across the state. That's up almost exactly um, 100 beds over where we were a year ago. So we continue to try to expand those shelter beds. Um, and I'll also just note that on May 31st, we also started sending letters to clients in our GA housing program, understanding that there were some uh, big changes ahead and that there needed to be some planning and that there would be some, some major transitions at this time of year. You know, So that was 80 days past July 1st is when some of the, uh, the, their stays were running out. Um, so we communicated with providers, we communicated with clients, we communicated with hotels multiple times through the summer uh, to try to give people notice and get folks as prepared as possible. So we continue to engage with communities. Um, we're trying to get these shelters uh, up and running and off the ground just as soon as possible, but it's uh, a constant challenge of the people to run the shelters, the buildings to house these shelters, the communities, the willing communities to host them. Uh, the providers are often involved and are aware and are trying, but it does take time. Um, so we expect with that $10 million of funding, um, we will have several projects going in the next couple of months, uh, but those always face uh, unknown obstacles and challenges and difficulties. And I think the legislature acknowledged that in giving us this funding um, by saying that if that funding isn't spent on shelters, it could be spent on other things like permanent supportive housing, which is another um, another initiative that, that uh, we started last year and would like to expand. Um, in addition to that, we um, issue over uh, $26 million in housing opportunity uh, program funds and so that goes to communities across the state to support services for those experiencing homelessness. Uh, we've also included in the budget a seven million dollar increase to support those extra 100 shelter beds in the coming year so that they are sustainable uh, and expect that you'll see us to continue invest in emergency shelters but it takes partners and it takes time. Um, I'll leave it there I guess. Just the only follow up there. I think what's what's different this time around after talking with service providers, advocates, and others is that there's kids 
that are being exited this time around. Um, you know, Commissioner Winters even said, you know, family shelters are still a need for those. Um, so I guess my question is, maybe big picture, like what do you see the role of, or the responsibility of the state being in terms of helping kids? Obviously, we want to help uh, any family who is, uh, who is struggling uh, with, uh, with homelessness. So, and we've done so, and we'll prioritize those the best we can. Um, having shelters, uh, the capacity for the congregate type of shelters that, ex that has uh, the families in mind is important. Uh, and we're able to, um, we're looking at a couple right now uh, where we think that that could be suitable. Um, and, um, but as we said, it's complicated. It's not just the building, it's the community. Um, as you probably know, we, we have one set up ready to go in Waterbury, but um, the community has pushed back uh, on that and, and wants us to get a zoning permit. I think we've been denied actually a zoning permit for that, but it's there ready uh, to be utilized. Uh, and we have others as well, but we're going to have to have the providers. We're going to have to have uh, the buy-in from the community. Uh, and the appropriation enough money to do it. So we're working on that and we think that there are some viable solutions. On both sides of the coast, there's a port dock strike going on. Do you see that playing any role here in Vermont and impacting others? <coughs> I think it's going to affect uh, the entire country in some respects, yes. In what respects? Like, do you have any kind of examples? Or well, I mean, we, we, we see what happens. Um, we saw during the pandemic uh, when you have a, a shortage of inventory, let's say, you're waiting for uh, materials to come uh, to be distributed throughout the country. And, uh, and, and that leads to when there's a fear that you're not going to have what you need, people start stocking up. Uh, that creates a shortage, uh, and then there's uh, supply and demand issues, which means the price goes up. So uh, not being able to get the materials, uh, spiking uh, this uh, rush to, to uh, possibly uh, stock up, um, and, um, and just the disruption in the supply chain is going to all lead to you know, higher prices, I believe, and, and could be, uh, have a negative effect on our economy throughout the country. And then it's been a couple weeks now, maybe a week and a half. Um, the Cannabis Control Board paused retail licensing pretty much just a couple days before the two-year anniversary of recreational marijuana in the state. Did that surprise you, I guess, kind of looking back on it all now, that there's already this oversaturation in the market that they're saying? I, I'm not sure that it surprises me. Um, I think that, uh, as I, I said before, we, there are other states doing this. Um, it's not as lucrative as some people think. It's still a lot of work. Any business is, uh, is challenging, and, uh, and I don't think this is any exception. So uh, you need customers. And then my last question. Did you watch the VP debate last night? Or so any thoughts? I, I watched part of it, and, uh, and at first I was uh, reluctant to watch because I thought it was just going to be uh, another repeat of what we're seeing, you know, on in, on the airwaves uh, in terms of personal attacks and so forth, but I was pleasantly surprised. And forget about the content, uh, but the way they treated one another um, was respectful and civil, and that's the way debate should happen. Um, and you know, maybe they can be an example for the way uh, we should be doing things. But, uh, but I thought they both handled themselves very well. All right, we'll go to the phones. Carly, BT Digger. Great, can you hear me okay? We can. Okay, great. Uh, I wanna follow up on some of Calvin's questions earlier. So you were talking about that $10 million of funding for shelter that that's you know, meant to, to bolster shelter capacity around the turn of the year. You know, what lawmakers in that letter yesterday and municipal leaders have called for is, is something more immediate for the, the state to stand up shelters right now for people exiting the motels. So. Are you considering deploying emergency shelters this fall to, to meet the needs of people exiting motels now? Yeah, we've always intended to do whatever we can to set up shelters as, shelters as quickly as possible. Um, it's part of what we had been asking for. Again, uh, I think VHCB has uh, received money um, 
both past and present uh, that we thought was working towards that as well. So uh, again, I'm going to turn it over to Secretary Samuelson and then Commissioner Winters uh, to fill in the gaps, but, um, but we've always intended uh, for, to move forward as quickly as possible, but we need, we need some partners in order to do that. Well, thank you, Governor. I think that that's absolutely right. We uh, intend to really look at what's happening on the ground and to be strategic uh, versus reactionary. And so in that case, we've um, already looked at buildings across the state that might be relevant and appropriate. Um, but what we learned from the last time is it's important for us to know what the scope and scale of the need is um, so that we are effectively using our resources and serving Vermonters. What we really, you know, to put to put this in context, because many people talk about it as if the number of people exiting is the, num is the actual need. But to put this in context, the team that we have, the triage team, has received between 25 and 35 uh, appropriate referrals to it. When we look at the families uh, for individuals who have housing needs in our complex and really are exiting the program. When we look at when we look at the needs in family and family shelters across the state, and again, this is what we know now, and we will continue to respond to what's happening on the ground. But what we know now really is less than a dozen families with children um, who have exited the program who need it. Now, as we work with partners on the ground and as our field services directors really work closely with the local communities that information will change but that's informing our decisions about where and how to put up shelters um, some of the spaces that we've identified include as, as the governor said the waterbury armory where we were proactive to set up a shelter a shelter space in response but we really need the support of the town in order to be able to move forward. We know that there's been calls in Burlington and we've been working closely with community providers in that area and we believe that we're more likely to be able to find a provider who could run a shelter in that area. So we've been looking at, at properties in that area that we might use. But again, if we were to use something like the Williston um, police barracks, we would need to do that in partnership with both the local providers and the town um, to ensure that the needs of the communities that we're trying to serve are really met. But I want to make sure that we put that in scope and scale and make sure that folks know that our goal here is to really be strategic versus just react, just reacting. And in order to do that, we need to, we need to be able to see um, what's happening in the local communities and to partner with those local communities and those local service providers. And that's what, that's what we have been doing. And so I'd turn it over to Commissioner Winters to see if you, have, you or to be uh, Commissioner Gray have anything to add there. I think the only thing that I'd add to that, Secretary Samuelson, is we can't talk about homelessness without talking about housing. And while, you know, we can talk about standing up more shelters, particularly for families, um, we do have the resources to place people into affordable housing units if we have the units available. We'd much rather be working in that direction than standing up more shelter beds. So given the choice between shelter beds or more affordable housing units, we'll take units every single time. Um, so just a, just a quick reminder that we really need to be talking about how to create more affordable housing in Vermont that will go a long ways to alleviating the unsheltered homelessness that we do see in this state. I think um, I, I, I just oh, want to just want to add to uh, Commissioner Winters and the call for more housing. I mean, that's the bottom line. We're in a housing crisis. We've known that for a number of years. Uh, two years ago, many many legislators campaigned on this issue. Uh, we fell far short, or this legislature fell far short of achieving those goals, and, uh, and instead worked on a conservation bill instead of a housing <coughs> bill. And what we need is more housing. So um, I think that uh, when you're pointing a finger at us, uh, they should look in the mirror and, and look at partially the blame uh, can, be, can be laid uh, in their laps as well. We need, again, more housing to satisfy the need. As well, I wanted to go back a little bit back in the spring, just to go down memory lane a bit, um, when they demanded Many demanded that we set up shelters. 
uh, for uh, those who are going to be unhoused in a short amount of time. So we, um, we did. We set up shelters in Rutland, uh, in uh, Middlesex, or maybe it was Montpelier, Montpelier and uh, in Burlington, and there may have been one other. And um, what we found was we, we did the work. We found people to, to uh, oversee them and uh, we opened them up and uh, we didn't have the clientele that we thought we were going to. So when Secretary Samuelson talks about not being reactionary and anticipating what the need is, I think it's important that we don't waste precious resources, that we are able to fill the need um, by watching what's happening on the ground. And that's what we're trying to do as well. So go ahead, Carly. Great, thank you. I wanted to follow up on um, some of the numbers you were sharing, Secretary Samuelson, around families in need right now. I mean, I know on September 19th alone, 79 families exited the program. So how are you getting those numbers that it's you know more like, I think, 25 or even a dozen families that are in need through your triage teams? Yeah, so our triage teams have been working with providers um, on the ground. Um, and they have been taking referrals uh, for the complex, for those who have really complex needs um, into that team. They've been working closely um, with the clients, uh, many of whom are just now uh, willing to look at alternative options. So that's one mechanism. Our field services directors have also um, been working on the ground um, and you know, we know, for example, in Burlington uh, at North Beach, they set up uh, camping for uh, families. And so we've been monitoring that. There is, because individuals don't have to say where they are going um, and what their next steps and next plan are, um, there isn't a, a specific data system to collect that information. And so we have been relying on the work um, with our partners um, to help us understand what they're seeing and to, quanti and to quantify um, that specifically so that we can identify the next step um, solutions. Um, again, the numbers aren't perfect um, and they will change. They will um, both, you know, they potentially grow or as we learn more, they may um, decline. Um, but we really work closely with uh, the, the providers that um, the Office of Economic Opportunity works with. We work closely with the cities and towns. Um, and again, there's not going to be a perfect number for the need. Um, and it's also important for us to recognize that these transitions have been in this first in this round have been happening for about two weeks, and so it will take us. Um, some time to continue to work with those providers to quantify that. So I wonder if um, Commissioner Winters, if you want to add in there, um, again, it's, it, it's um, it, we are looking at what's happening um, and working with providers who are working with people on the ground. Yeah, not much to add there, just that we know that the, the, the numbers will keep shifting um, as the 80 days change, as people find options. We know that sometimes people can only find temporary options um we know that some hotels are uh, allowing self-pay um and so people are staying in in hotels by paying for a, a bit of time and then we know um that eligibility will change once again or the number of rooms will be opened up once again on, on december 1st so it's all worth um trying to dig in as much as we can to find out what the actual need is so that we can target our limited resources at those who need it most, and that certainly includes children, families with children. Yeah, you know, one more question. You know, what what conditions would you need to observe before taking a next step? Is there a you know a benchmark you're looking for in order to you know take a any any kind of more immediate intervention here? I think the the providers in the in the communities know it know it best, and we want to hear from them. We want to work with them to assess the need. Um, when we talk about uh, a shelter, um, congregate shelters are not ideal for families, so that com complicates things. But also when we talk about a shelter, it could be a five or six bed shelter, it could be a 10 or 15 bed shelter, it could be something you know large like we put up 
uh, last year that didn't get much use, um, but we want to make sure that the need is there and that we're um, focusing our resources in an efficient and effective way. Thank you. Abigail in Vermont Public. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? We can. Excellent. Um, Governor, I, I have a question for you that's uh, a little bit of a pivot towards energy policy. Um, I know the PUC yesterday issued its draft rule for a clean heat standard, along with a companion report recommending an alternative path forward. Um, the PUC also pointed out that ample analysis has shown that Vermont's current programs and level of funding for them are not sufficient alone to comply with the emissions reduction requirements under the Global Warming Solutions Act. So I'm curious. The commission says a fee on fossil heating fuels would be a better and more cost-effective way to address this problem than a clean heat standard. Would you support imposing a fee on the sale of fossil heating fuels similar to what we have for electricity? Well, again, I haven't seen the report. I see our commissioner is on. She's probably seen, uh, seen that. But it is a report to the legislature. Um, they will deal with this and then We'll make a decision at that point. Um, as you recall, uh, I did veto the message, uh, the the measure. Um, so, I, and I resisted uh, any fee increases. So we'll we'll see what it looks like and uh, what their projections are. But I haven't have not seen the report. Mr. Tierney, have you seen anything or at this point? I'm I'm, I'm aware generally, Governor, of the description that uh, Abigail just gave, but um, the department has not yet seen the report in full and examined what exactly it says. I'm not surprised by um, the description given so far. Um, these things were uh, visible for many people who followed the subject matter closely. Uh, the tax piece is a completely different uh, subject matter that is new to the mix um, that the PUC has inserted. But at this time, I would need to look at the report before I comment it any further. And I would... Um, and, and I would also add, Governor, it's a draft report, so yeah. it's been put out for public comment, and uh, the PUC is typically very attentive to public comment, so I think it should be treated that way at this time. Well, again, if it, especially if it's a, a change in, in the approach, it would um, most definitely have to go through the legislative process. Uh, any tax proposals would start in the House and make its way through the House and then into the Senate and uh, then to the, to the governor if it gets that far. So it's got a long ways to go, I guess, before any decisions have to be made about that. Um, great. Thank you both very much. Tim McQuiston, Vermont Business Magazine. Uh, hi, Governor. I'm wondering if you have a reaction to the lower court ruling on Secretary Saunders. In that case, it was kind of a split decision. Uh, I didn't view it as a split decision. I thought it was overwhelmingly supportive of our position. Well, it, just in regards to whether the um, uh, there was uh, legal standing for the uh, people who brought the brought the suit. Um, I, I, I don't know if that has much to do with the final decision, but you know I'm not a lawyer. Well, just I took it as good. Come, I took it as good news. Obviously, it's going to go to the Supreme Court, and um, you know, what, what are you are you anticipating what what they will uh, say at this point? Well, again, I'm not a lawyer, but uh, but I'm not. I, I haven't heard that it's going to the Supreme Court. I don't think that's automatic. Well, not automatic, but it, it, it's sort of the, the anticipated route of this of this case, and and then inevitably the the legislature just might take it up as well. Yeah, well, it seems like we have bigger fish to fry than that one. But um, I might ask my general counsel to come up and comment on this as well. Thanks, Governor. Um, yeah, thanks, Tim. I, yeah, I would say you're correct. Um, they prevailed on standing. Um, they lost on the merits, which means that the court decided the governor has the constitutional authority to appoint uh, interim Secretary Saunders as an interim appointee. Um, that there was constitutional basis for that decision, I think, was really important. 
Um, the court also pointed out that the senators do not have constitutional authority um, of advice and consent. That's statutory. So I think that all around, we're very happy with the decision. It's not clear whether they will appeal the case yet. Um, there are certainly initiatives that the legislature can always undertake, but we are concerned about the constitutionality of limits on the governor's constitutional powers. So um, I think I think that's that's where we stand on this case. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Sure. Back to the room. Speaking of education, declining test scores again. Uh, you know, why is that happening, and what can be done? Yeah, well, again, Secretary Saunders, uh, Interim Secretary Saunders, has been uh, highlighting that and uh, wants to move forward with trying to, to increase um, those, those scores. Uh, and uh, maybe I can, I don't know if she's on today. She's not on. Not on. I'll have her uh, contact you. We, I don't know if we've announced what we're doing yet or what she wants to do. But um, I'll have her give her you, give you a call. I've been wondering how much losing a year to in-school COVID had anything to do with that, especially because it's it's the lower grades it seems that yeah. are suffering the most. Well, again, you know the rest of the country faced the same thing, um, and so you would assume that we'd all go down at the same rate, and we have gone from being at the top of the of the rung uh, down to somewhere in the middle at this point. So. That's concerning. We should be able to talk about the whys, because really there's so much stuff going on with kids these days that's unprecedented. It's got to be showing up in the schools. Uh, you know what? What's going on with our kids, and, and what can the state and the schools do about it? Um, well, again, we should be doing all we can to provide a safe environment, a productive environment for our kids in schools and uh, provide uh, for their education. And uh, we just need to focus, on, I believe, focus on the fundamentals. I think uh, respect and civility is important. I talked about it in terms of the debate last night, but when we have uh, politicians and uh, elected leaders uh, that, are, that are, um, are, are engaging in this polarized uh, approach and uh, with name calling and, and so forth, I don't think that's good for our kids. Uh, it's not good for society and uh, we can do better. But I think it starts both at the bottom and the top. I mean, we all need to act more appropriately. Governor, also this week the uh, Department of Forest Parks and Recreation put out the um, management plan for the Worcester Range, Mount Hunger, um, Stowe Pinnacle, a few others. Have you been following this conversation about how, how it should be used? Any, any thoughts? There's concerns from some advocates that this opens the door to too much logging. Is that what's, what's your, yeah. your read on the situation? Well, I think harvesting uh, timber is important to our state, and we should be doing it in a uh, productive way uh, that uh, doesn't harm the environment and have great faith in our agency of natural resources to provide uh, for that um, because it's, it's, you know, again, precious resource, but it's a precious resource in terms of uh, um, the, our economy as well. Secretary Moore, uh, do you have something you'd like to add to that? Uh, yes, Governor, thank you. I would just add that, that the overall Worcester Range Management Unit is, covers a total of just over 18,000 acres. Um, our proposed management strategy would have uh, logging occur on just about 1,900 acres spread out over the next 20 years. So it's a pretty modest component um, of our overall work to steward that important area of Vermont. Uh, and over half of the Worcester Range Management Unit has been set aside um, given its ecological values as it meets the criteria that the legislature established under Act 59 as an ecological reserve. Um, and so it's, it's a little bit frustrating to see the focus placed on, on what is just one smaller component of a much larger management strategy that's seeking to balance um, significant re recreational use um, from trail hiking on Hunger Mountain to mountain biking on Perry Hill. Um, along with some of the, the ecological connectivity and habitat function values 
as well as, as timber harvest and trying to make sure our forests are, are uh, resilient in the face of changing climate. Looks like we have one more uh, question on the phones. Ed Barber, Newport Daily Express. <clears throat> yeah, good afternoon, Governor. Can you hear me? We can. This question uh, I'm going to ask you, but um, Secretary Flynn might be able to respond as well. The uh, town of Brighton in Essex County suffered some pretty <laughs> catastrophic damage in July. They have to re they have a bridge that blew out. They need to replace, which will take a couple of years. The problem they have is, even though they're FEMA eligible. They're only going to receive $7,500 a month for six months to put in a in place a temporary bridge. They asked the VTrans if they could rent a bridge from the state, but the requirements that VTran has will not allow that um, because there's more than one way out, meaning you don't have to put in a temporary bridge and cross it. The difference here is that the town will end up paying $150,000 to $200,000 over the next couple of years to rent a bridge, but if they got a bridge from VTrans, it would be $150 a month. Considering all the catastrophic weather that we've been having, is it time to look at those VTrans rules and see if there is some wiggle room to allow communities to be able to get temp bridges by changing the regulations that VTrans has. Um, I th I'm going to let Secretary Flynn answer that, but I, I just want to say that we've been very flexible in terms of lending bridges to communities. Many, many uh, of our temporary bridges uh, have been lent to um, communities in need. So I don't know about the regulation, but, uh, but we're always willing to, to assist in any way we can. Secretary Flynn. Thank you, Governor. Uh, and I'm not particularly aware of this incident. I'm happy to, to look into it. Um, I am aware that in the past, we have come down on that decision. If there's another way in or out, and we have other communities who have no way in or out, uh, we have to make hard decisions about where we can use our bridges. And I also wonder when the question was asked, because I know back in August, if you will, or early September, we were right down pretty much close to rock bottom. In fact, we wanted to buy another 200 feet of temporary bridges, but that would cost us a million dollars. And so we just couldn't scrape that together. I do believe some bridges have come back in. Um, and I also know that we work with, uh, well, Forest and Parks. Uh, they have things that are called skitter bridges that may not be appropriate for where you're talking about it. But I'm happy to learn more about the exact location and where this alternate bridge is located. And as the governor said, uh, we're always uh, able, in fact, we, we've proven that in many communities to you know, reconsider things, but it really depended on maybe when the question was asked and what the circumstances were then. I also I would add, and, and maybe um, yeah, maybe Doug can, can enlighten us a bit here, but, uh, but I, I believe that that could be reimbursable as well, uh, the rental costs of a, of a bridge by FEMA. But I'm absolutely correct, Governor. Um, I think often, you know, if there is inventory at AOT for bridges, that's the most cost effective solution, but it would be a reimbursable uh, expense to FEMA. So 75% would be covered by FEMA. And then the state would cover the emergency relief assistance fund share, which could be between 30 and 70% of the remaining non-federal share. So the town uh, certainly would be looking at that full 200,000 as a liability. I know that cash flow can be a concern for communities, but ultimately, um, most of that expense would be would be covered by uh, state or federal partners. Okay, I, I think if um, if you contact uh, Eric Pope, uh, one of your employees, that he should be able to uh, give you a lot more uh, uh, not inside knowledge about what they're doing. And uh, they have a town manager, uh, Noah Bond, and uh, if you talk to him as well. I think they'd probably appreciate hearing from you. 
I'll look into that this afternoon, Ed. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's all I have. Thank you, Governor. All right. Thank you all. Appreciate it.